This is Endocrine Feedback Loop. I am your host, Chase Hendrickson, and welcome you to this Journal Club podcast series brought to you by Endocrine Society. Thanks for joining us as we explore an important article recently published in one of the Society's clinical journals. Hello, and welcome back to the Endocrine Feedback Loop for our 28th episode. For this episode of the podcast, we look at a recent study from the JCENM that will help us better understand some of the long-term metabolic effects of weight loss surgery. I hope that this report will inform our clinical care as it attempts to answer questions that our patients frequently ask us. It is an observational study, so we'll need to do our usual careful examination of the study design to better understand those intrinsic limitations of such an investigation. I continue to have the pleasure of hosting the Endocrine Feedback Loop. I work as a general endocrinologist at the Vanderbilt University Medical Center in Nashville, where I am also the medical director for our endocrinology clinics and an associate director for our fellowship program. Joining me yet again today as our regular contributor is Mark andre Cornier from the Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston. He is the division director there and, importantly for us today, works as both a clinician and a clinical and translational investigator in obesity. He is well known to many of you all in that role with his numerous publications and presentations. Our guest expert today is also an expert in obesity medicine. Dan Bessesen joins us from the University of Colorado in Denver, where he is the director of the Anschutz Health and Wellness Center and director of the Obesity Medicine Fellowship Program. He is also currently the president of the Obesity Society. He is a general endocrinologist, but has a clinical and research focus on obesity. So I've got a great pair of endocrinologists here today to explain this article to us. As is also always the case, everything discussed today will be our opinion only and not those of our respective institutions or the Endocrine Society. For this episode of the podcast, we review metabolic slowing vanished five years after sleep gastrectomy in patients with obesity and prediabetes diabetes which is a forthcoming article in the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism. This study comes to us from the University of Padova in Italy with Silvia Bettini as the first author. Now I'll turn things over to Mark. He will review the key points that the authors make in their introduction. Additionally, he and Dan will review some of the key concepts and unanswered questions around long-term effects of weight loss surgery. Mark? Great. Thanks, Chase. Yeah, so the kind of background on this paper is, you know, that we know that weight loss is associated with a reduction in resting energy expenditure. And this is primarily due to reductions in, in what we call fat-free mass. But there are some data that suggest that possibly there's a greater reduction in resting energy expenditure than expected. This has been called metabolic adaptation. So, you know, I wanted to ask Dan what his thoughts are on this impact of weight loss on resting energy expenditure and, and, and his thoughts on, on the concept of metabolic adaptation. Thanks, Mark. It's nice to talk to you. Mark worked with me. He was my fellow when I was a junior investigator. So it's terrific to get a chance to talk with you, Mark. Yeah, I think as endocrinologists, we see many people who struggle with their weight. And a fundamental development in our thinking clinically about obesity is the idea that obesity is a disease. And what do we mean by that? I think of obesity as a disease of body weight regulation. And and fundamental to that is the idea that weight is regulated, just like glucose or serum sodium or blood pressure. As endocrinologists, we often think about those feedback loops, the way some parameter that's your blood sugar goes up, then you secrete insulin, and that brings the sugar back where it's supposed to be. If weight is regulated, then the body has some idea where it wants the weight to be, and that involves energy expenditure and food intake. And for some people, just like some people have high blood sugar, some people have a high body weight, and that's a dysfunction of this fundamental regulatory system that, again, has those two pieces, food intake and energy expenditure. What we're talking about today is the energy expenditure side. Mark mentions resting energy expenditure, which highlights what are the components of energy expenditure. So total energy expenditure is how many calories you burn every day. And what's relevant there is that's how many calories I get to eat every day if my weight is going to be stable. If I'm going to lose weight, I have to eat fewer calories than that total energy expenditure. And the components of energy expenditure, there are resting energy expenditure. That's the energy, the cost of keeping sodium and potassium where they belong, keeping your body warm, keeping your heart pumping. 
resting energy expenditure can be measured in a human who's just resting, but awake, if they fall asleep, their energy expenditure falls a little bit. Uh, that's the energy cost of your brain on idle. So there's some energy cost there. And then there's the energy that we expend digesting food. That's the thermic effect of feeding. That's usually 8 or 10% of total energy expenditure. And then there's energy expended in physical activity. That's the most variable component of total energy expenditure. So what Mark is asking about is resting expenditure because that is the parameter that's measured in this study. But I think total energy expenditure is very relevant because, again, that's how many calories you get to eat. So what happens when weight is lost? Uh, again, if weight is a regulated parameter, then the body would try to restore the lost weight. Uh, and it would do that by driving the body to increase food intake and reducing energy expenditure, becoming more energy efficient with weight loss. So the idea of metabolic adaptation is this idea that when a person loses weight, the body senses that weight loss and tries to get the weight back where it's supposed to be, and does that uh, by reducing energy expenditure. Now, some reduction in energy expenditure happens just because the body is smaller. Uh, if you weigh less, then you have less ions to move around, less uh, blood to pump, less uh, body to heat. So some reduction in energy expenditure occurs just because the body's smaller. If you think about physical activity, if you weighed 200 pounds and then you lost down to 150, uh, you, you'd be carrying around 50 pounds less weight. So if you walk that same mile, you would burn less energy for that. And uh, so these reductions in energy expenditure are simply a reflection of the weight that's lost. Uh, so you can sort of draw a line with the relationship between energy expenditure and weight. Uh, that line doesn't go through zero. It's, it's got a non-zero intercept because there's some energy cost of just being alive. That probably relates to the energy expenditure of the brain, the kidney, the heart, these vital organs. Uh, but otherwise, there's sort of a linear relationship between weight and energy expenditure, whether resting or total energy expenditure. But there's some variability around that. This idea of metabolic adaptation is that, is that when a person loses weight, they don't just go down that line because of the lost weight. They actually come off the line and become more energy efficient than you would predict based on their body size. This general idea of metabolic adaptation has been highlighted, I think, for three reasons. Uh, the first is it's a sign that weight is regulated. Because if there is metabolic adaptation, that supports this fundamental idea that the body has an idea of where it wants to weigh. And if the body isn't there, it's going to do something to get the weight back. I think another reason this idea of metabolic adaptation is important is that maybe this is why people regain weight when they lose weight. How many of us see people in the clinic who say, doctor, I'm eating nothing and I'm gaining weight? Again, it's the balance between energy intake and energy expenditure that drives weight regain. So weight regain is another reason that metabolic adaptation is important. I guess the last thing for me is I just think it's a fascinating thing to study. The first studies of metabolic adaptation started in 1950 when Ansel Keys did a study in Minnesota. It really grew out of the experience of World War II when people were starving. And so he was the first to really study experimental starvation in normal lean men. And what he found was that with starvation, these lean men became incredibly energy efficient. They took almost no calories to maintain their being. So where was that energy efficiency coming from? I think almost 60% of it came from reduced physical activity. Remember, we talked about those different components of it, total energy expenditure, resting energy expenditure, thermic effect of food, and physical activity. What these normal lean men did when they were underfed was they markedly reduced their spontaneous physical activity. We'll come back to that as it relates to this study as well. But they also had a reduction in their resting energy expenditure beyond what you'd uh, think it would be reduced by, simply by the uh, loss of weight. Yeah, so those are some general thoughts about metabolic adaptation. Yeah, no, that's great, Dan. Thank you. And that really sets the stage. So in diet-induced weight loss, there appears to be this metabolic adaptation that can last you know, upward years. But the authors here say that there's really no clear idea of how long this lasts after bariatric surgical procedures and whether it happens at all with bariatric surgery and specifically in the case of this study after laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy. So I think we'd love to you, hear your comments, Dan, on the data and the controversy regarding this metabolic adaptation after aggressive weight loss, i.e. surgery, but 
for example, in the whole Biggest Loser study, I know there was a lot of controversy there about that and whether that was really uh, a real thing or not. And should we expect that with bariatric surgery as well? Yeah, so I mentioned Ansel Keyes original studies. One of the other classic studies was done by Rudy Libel and Mike Rosenbaum, published in the New England Journal in 1995. And here again, they took people and experimentally reduced their weight, 5 or 10%, and measured their energy expenditure very carefully, resting energy expenditure with hood calorimetry, total energy expenditure with other methods. We'll get to that in a bit. And they showed this metabolic efficiency a few months after the weight loss. Then people said, is this just an acute phenomena? And so what happens with longer periods of weight loss? And a number of other groups look six months, even a year after weight loss through diet alone. And that became controversial. It was very clear that metabolic efficiency adaptation occurs early after weight loss, but different studies came to different conclusions looking six and 12 months later. This Biggest Loser study, some of you maybe saw this TV show where people did a whole lot of exercise and on a very low calorie diet and lost huge amounts of weight on a TV show. And uh, Kevin Hall, who's at the NIH, studied those folks right after they lost weight and were stabilized for a few months and found four, almost 500 calories of this metabolic adaptation, meaning not only was their energy intake, how many calories they could eat, went way down because their body was smaller, it was even lower by 500 calories. I mean, that's a lot. Imagine cutting your calories by 500 per day in addition to what you have to do because you lost that weight. Wow, that's why it's hard to lose weight. But the question was, what happened later on? And so in this so-called biggest loser study, Kevin Paul and collaborators followed up on those people five, six years later and found that that metabolic adaptation was still there five, six years later. Now, again, there's controversy here because some studies looking six months, one year later, did not find persistence of metabolic adaptation. Found it early, but once the weight loss was maintained for a long period of time, it seemed to go away. But this biggest loser study found that it was still there. What was different about that study is those folks lost a lot of weight, and they were sort of a select group of people. Because they had had marked obesity before, they weren't sort of like the typical people that we see in clinic. So I think this question about how about surgery, and we can talk more about this later. Surgery is the best treatment we have for weight loss. Again, those of you in clinic and you're talking to your patients, what do you say to them? You could try diet and exercise. You could try medications. You could try surgery. And surgery is the most effective treatment we have. Why is surgery effective? And one possibility is that surgery uniquely affects those fundamental drivers of weight regain, appetite and energy expenditure. And there's data about appetite that relates to hormones like GLP-1 and things like that. But this study is looking at that other side, which is does surgery maybe have a unique effect on metabolic adaptation, which it may be part of the reason why it helps promote long-term weight loss. Well, the other thing about metabolic adaptation is the, you know, what are the mechanisms? And the authors uh, allude to some potential mechanisms such as changes in leptin or thyroid hormone or sympathetic nervous system as potential contributors. What are your thoughts, Dan, on what are the most likely mechanisms to explain this metabolic efficiency or adaptation? Uh, I had mentioned the work done by Rudy Libel and Mike Rosenbaum, they, who experimentally had people lose weight and then maintain that weight loss. And they found that this uh, metabolic adaptation or reduction in energy expenditure was associated with low levels of T3, higher levels of reverse T3. The endocrinologists know that as euthyroid 6 syndrome, which we see in people who've lost weight and might conceivably be associated with low energy expenditure. They also found lower levels of catecholamines and lower levels of leptin. When they looked at this metabolic adaptation, they looked at total energy expenditure, and they found that the energy expended in exercise went down out of proportion to the actual work of the exercise. People became more efficient in their exercise, and they added the leptin back and showed that the efficiency went back to normal with leptin. So they hypothesized leptin deficiency in the reduced state played a fundamental role in this metabolic adaptation. So I think those three players, uh, thyroid hormone, catecholamines, and leptin, have been studied before. So those are the classic ones. I must say, as I read this study, and the core issue that's unique about this is the surgery piece. 
And could surgery uniquely address metabolic adaptation and how would it do that? Well, what do we know about how surgery works? I think there's been a lot of focus on GLP-1 as a mediator of the benefits of surgery. There's also data on bile acids that comes from animal work. This group did not look at this, and other groups have not looked at those other gut hormones and how they might relate to total energy expenditure and this issue of metabolic adaptation. Well, I think with all that in mind, the study was done with the goal to evaluate the changes in resting energy expenditure and other metabolic parameters and evaluate how metabolic adaptation at one and five years post laparoscopic sleep gastrectomy in patients with uh, severe obesity and how varying degrees of glucose metabolism impairments might impact those relationships. So I'll turn it over to Chase now to discuss the study design and methods. Good. Thanks, Mark. That was a really helpful overview, pointing out some of those key points and questions. And, and Dan, thanks for that that great uh, overview of both current questions that we've got and also historical uh, ideas and, and, and how that understanding has evolved over time. So what we're going to do is we usually do, we're going to think carefully about the study design here, because I do think that is going to be important to how we interpret these results. And, and what we're going to do, first of all, a little bit different than usual, I'm going to describe what these authors do, and then we're going to try to work backwards to try to figure out what study design is the best way to describe this, because the authors aren't they don't actually use a label to, to describe what it is that they use here. So, so their description, they've got 37 patients that they analyze. They point out that this actually came from a larger group, 154 patients who had participated in a previous study. All this work was done at the Padua University Hospital and specifically the Center for the Study and Integrated Treatment of Obesity that's there. So what they did, Mark mentioned this already, but they did evaluation of these individuals before surgery, but then a year after after surgery and then five years after surgery. And that's the data that they're going to present. And a comment on, on why I make that disclaimer about it, it's kind of unclear exactly what study design they use is how they analyze this. There's a few different ways. When you're following subjects, patients over time, it depends on how you split them into groups and how you compare them as to how you would describe that. If you split folks into different groups based on a certain exposure and then compare them to each other, compared one group to another, that would be how we would describe a cohort study. And it could be retrospective or prospective depending upon when and how you set that up. And, and so the authors do this. We'll look at this as, as Mark walks us through some of these results here in a few minutes. So they do split people into groups based on exposure, but primarily when they're comparing, when they're when they're presenting their data, they are not primarily comparing folks between these groups. They're comparing them within groups. So they'll split folks into different groups, and then we'll look at it here. It was mentioned already in the in the title, but they're specifically looking at abnormalities in glucose metabolism, and that's how they divide folks into groups. And then they're comparing and say, over time, if you were in this group, what did things look like? Specifically, this metabolic adaptation, what did that look like? There is a little bit of group-to-group -group comparison, so I don't know that we can put a single label and say this is how they did it every time. But I'd say mostly this, this functions as a case series because you're taking a group of people and saying this is how this group did over time after an intervention. So I, I did want to stop here and, and get Dan's thoughts and, and Mark's as well uh, about thoughts that you would have. Well, you guys are used to looking at this type of data, this, this clinical data. Data. And when you see this and see that they're only comparing individuals within a group and, and limited comparison between group, what, what thoughts do you have? Is that raise concerns in your mind or any limitations that that would put as you think about their, their findings? Or maybe I'll comment on that. You know, I think whenever I read a study about metabolic adaptation, because there's controversy here, and what I'd like to know is, is this true or is it not true? <laughs> and so these issues of study design are really important. And I feel like the two key elements are, how are they measuring these different parameters and who are the people that they're studying? And so I think this idea that it's sort of a cohort that they're following or a group of patients that they're following, I think it, it's a strength because it's a surgical group that's followed for a long time. So that's the good part. We don't have a lot of surgical studies, and we don't have almost none that are longitudinal follow. So the group is a good one. But we'll get to the measures in a minute, but the measures have some problems. In some ways, it would be nice to have a comparator group where you think there would be a difference. And are their methods rigorous enough to see a difference that we would expect to be there? Because what they find at this later time point is no difference. Yeah, but do they have the power to find a difference? meaning were their methods robust enough to find it in this group. And having a comparator group where they did find a difference would give you a little more of a sense of 
the rigor of their methods. Right. And I would think not having a comparison group also, what's the actual percent change when we look at these different parameters? How different is it compared to you know, diet and just weight loss? Or, you know, is this really significantly different than what we would expect? And five years is not a long follow up, but could there be an age effect? Just as we get older, we might have a change in lean mass that might alter some of these parameters. It would have been nice to have a, a control group, but again, as I think Dan mentioned, there's still some power to the longitudinal follow-up here. But, and then another question that I would have as we think about when we get to the results and the conclusions, how we can interpret those and also how we can generalize those. So specifically, all of these individuals had just a single type of weight loss surgery. Mark pointed that out already. So, uh, Dan, maybe we'll start with you here. Help us understand there are different types of, of weight loss surgery. When we think about those, should we be lumping those together and thinking, yeah, they're a little different, but from at least an endocrine weight loss perspective, they're more similar than dissimilar? Or should we be looking it doesn't say, no, these are radically different type of surgeries. We can't lump them all together and assume that they're going to have the same output. How do you think about this in, in, in terms of generalizing those type of information? Yeah, there are kind of four most commonly done surgeries. There's the, the laparoscopic banding, which is almost not done anymore. But I say it because as endocrinologists, we see people who had banding procedures done 10, 15 years ago. That's an important thing for you to remember because that little plastic thing stuck around the stomach can have mechanical problems, and the surgeons aren't seeing those people anymore. You're seeing them. And so if that banding is on your problem list, it's important to think about. But that was not a very effective surgery, certainly not as effective as sleeve gastrectomy. Sleeve gastrectomy is now the most common operation done because it's relatively easy for the surgeon, and it gives pretty good weight loss. Gastric bypass is kind of a gold standard operation. It's more effective than the sleeve gastrectomy. There's more plumbing changes, and it works better and has more durability over time. So I think if we see a difference with sleeve gastrectomy, one wonders if it might even be more robust in a, somebody with gastric bypass. And then there's the biliary pancreatic diversion. That's not commonly done. That's a very aggressive surgery with even more weight loss. So yes, the surgeries are different. I think the fact that they're looking at sleeve, that's the most common one. So I think it's a relevant group. And then we'll look quickly here at the protocol that they use, and then we'll uh, we'll get Mark and Dan's input on this as to whether this is a fairly standard approach in clinical care and also in, in research here. But what they do, so they have a baseline evaluation, and that was within six months of the surgery, but before the patients began a very low calorie diet leading up to the surgery. The individuals had regular follow up visits, and again, as we talked about before, they had a, a one year and a five year post surgery evaluation that we're going to look at shortly. They were all routinely counseled on low-calorie diets and physical activity. So, Mark, we'll start with you. Does this look pretty similar to, to what you folks do at MUSC? Yeah, I think this is pretty standard. Uh, surgeons like to put patients on low-calorie diets preoperatively to shrink up the livers, make the procedure easier, get some weight loss ahead of time. I think what, to me, when I see this, though, it would have been nice to have another baseline, right, after the very low-calorie diet to see how much of this change was at year one was due to the surgical induced weight loss versus the very low-calorie diet that actually happened before the surgery. Thanks. Dan, comments on how, how similar this is to what you all do or any other questions or concerns there? Yeah, I mean, I, I will say one thing that's typical, there's a lot of dropout we'll get to. And so I think the surgeons follow up folks closely at first, and then often that relationship goes away. And that's why as endocrinologists, it's important that we think about these folks because we often become the long-term care providers. I'd also just highlight what happens with weight loss. People, even with surgery, lose a bunch of weight at first. And that's when most of that metabolic adaptation is strong. And then the weight loss slows. And then there's a plateau, but then often there's weight regain over the years. So when we think about metabolic adaptation, it's probably related to energy balance. And so this, the protocol is similar to what we do. I just want to highlight that weight trajectory over time following surgery and how that might influence these results. 
you know, as we think about inclusion and exclusion criteria, Dan mentioned it already, but only a small group of people agreed to participate in this. So initially, there were quite a few individuals. So the larger study had initially had 154 folks. But then of those who agreed to participate, initially, there were 47. They ended up with just 37. But initially, 47 folks agreed to participate. Now, the authors, I think, helpfully looked at those and said, at least of all the things that they measured, they couldn't find any obvious differences between the 47 who agreed and the 107 who didn't. Though I do think it's always important to point out, this is true for virtually any clinical research studies, that there's going to be a volunteer bias. The folks who agree to participate in these studies are really a subset. They're a unique phenotype uh, as far as folks who are interested in participating in this type of work. So we do have to be a little bit careful in generalizing to the larger uh, population, but but that is something that we need to keep in mind there. Uh, the authors list several exclusion criteria uh, that, that we may want to think about and wrestle a little bit more again as we think about generalizability of these results. When I was looking at that list, the biggest one that jumped out is they uh, excluded the, the use of weight loss medication. So these folks were not on those in the post-operative setting, uh, but a few few other medications as well served as exclusion criteria. Now, uh, Dan mentioned this already, but we want to think carefully about some of the data collection and measurements that are used here. Some of the ones are relatively standard, some anthropometric measurements, some body composition measurements. There's quite a few labs that Mark's going to walk us through here in just a minute, and those were all done after an eight-hour fast. Uh, one of the things in particular, and I'll let Dan comment on any of these other ones that he wanted to, but but energy expenditure. So, so Dan, help us understand that. The, the description there was fairly technical, which I think was appropriate, but for a lot of us who are not spending a lot of time in the obesity field, it's always a bit of a mystery, this resting energy expenditure. We vaguely understand what it is, but maybe not the particulars of exactly how it's measured and, and what issues there may be with accuracy of that. So, so can you give us just a high-level overview of, of how we, in general, measure resting energy expenditure and how the authors did it here? Yeah. When I started out, I talked about total energy expenditure because that's how many calories your patient gets to eat. And so part of the issue here is they measure resting energy expenditure pretty well, put calorimetry. That's a good way to do it, sort of a gold standard, but it only gives you part of the total energy expenditure. As I mentioned before, in Ansel Key's original study, part of metabolic adaptation was reduced physical activity. And how did they measure that just with questionnaires as opposed to something more rigorous? You can measure total energy expenditure with a method called doubly labeled water. That looks at turnover of the oxygen atom in water, which is a reflection of oxygen consumption. That's how calorimetry works. It measures oxygen consumption as a measure of energy expenditure because our mitochondria consume oxygen, produce CO2. That is energy expenditure. So doubly labeled water is the gold standard for measuring total energy expenditure. So resting energy expenditure, that's good with a hood calorimetry. It just is a little bit of an incomplete picture because it doesn't give us total energy expenditure and it doesn't tell us much about physical activity. Good. And then one final comment then about physical activity, Dan referenced that, but this was based on interview questions. And so I wanted to try to get a better understanding of that. Mark, maybe we'll start with you here thinking about this. I, I think um, uh, survey-based questions, we, we understand a lot that particularly around food intake, there's a lot of concerns about accuracy and recall on that. But but what are your thoughts on uh, physical activity? Is that a fairly reliable way in, in research or in clinical care for, for patients to accurately report what their degree of physical activity is? It really depends what your goals are here. Uh, you know, I think if you want to know if someone is sedentary or, or is active, you know, these kind of questionnaires are, are probably fine in clinical care. In a research study, you know, I think you want to be a little more objective. There's, you know, well-known problems with self-report like this. You know, with food intake, people under-report. And the, the greater the obesity, the greater the underreporting. With physical activity, it's the opposite. There's significant overreporting. So I think that is a concern. Now, this is a you know secondary analysis. It's not a you know a, you know, endpoint. It's not a primary. I think to measure physical activity more in a better quantified way using activity monitors, et cetera, would have been preferred, but certainly a little more complex and involved. So we have to look at these data and, and understand that there are some limitations to these measurements. 
Good. And then just a final word before we move on from the methodology on the statistics, well, we won't belabor anything here, but again, to point out with the different statistics that the authors use, they're primarily comparing folks within groups. Mark's going to talk about this, but they split people into normal glucose metabolism and diabetes and prediabetes. And what they're looking at is if there is a significant change over time in this metabolic adaptation within these groups, not between these groups. So I think that's going to be a helpful thing for us to, to keep in mind. It's not totally true. They do a few other types of analyses, but that, that's the main one that they do. So, so with that, we'll, we'll wrap up the method section here. I'm going to turn it back over to Mark for him to walk us through the results. It's a lot of data here, so he's going to help us uh, keep focused on what we need to and, and review this at a high level. Great. So if you're following along with the paper, I would turn you to table two. These are the primary results for many of the outcomes. So we'll start with the baseline. Who, who are these people? What do they look like? You know, they're middle age, aged 45 approximately on average. About two-thirds are women, pretty typical for a study that is in the obesity field. The BMI is 45, so in the severely elevated range, inappropriate for individuals undergoing bariatric surgery. Uh, they have insulin resistance as uh, determined by HOMA model. Lipids look pretty good. They have pretty normal metabolic panels. They have some evidence of some generalized systemic inflammation. They have elevated leptin levels as expected, normal thyroid function overall. They have significant elevations in fat mass. And we'll look at the percent fat mass, and it's you know 43%, which is quite high. Then they turn to the data at year one and then out year two. And you know, the primary data first are, are what happened to weight. And so at the bottom of the table, you'll see that the change in weight loss, it's the total weight loss. And that's 31%. Now, we don't have a placebo or comparison group to know what they would have done otherwise, but 31% weight loss is pretty fantastic overall. Also, they report the excess weight loss, which is what the surgeons like to report, which was 71%. Now, when you go to year five, that weight loss from baseline was only 22%. So they gained about 9% weight back at the five-year mark. And so there was weight regain. If you look at the metabolic parameters, pretty much all of them improved at year one, and pretty much all of them stayed improved out to year five. And you can see the p-values to the right in the table. So we're talking about all the metabolic parameters, the insulin and glucose metabolism parameters, all improved significantly and remained there. Now, the fat mass, interestingly, it improved significantly at year one, but then increased at year five. Whereas the fat-free mass, more of the lean mass, it increased at year one and then decreased at year five. So they had weight regain, which you would expect would be associated with increased fat mass and fat-free mass, but then they did not have a more fat-free mass gain at year five. So there was weight regain at year five, which was associated with increased fat mass gain, but not with an increase in fat-free mass at year five. Dan, what do you think about this weight regain? Was this expected? Is this the kind of percents that you see in your, in your clinical experience? And why didn't they regain fat-free mass? Yeah, I'll make a, just a couple of comments on the data you just reviewed there. First is 31% weight loss with a sleeve gastrectomy. Who are these people? That is way more than the average. Again, with all our weight loss treatment, there's tremendous variability. There's people that lose more, people that lose less. And since we only have 37 out of 154, I think this is a clue that this is a different group. The other thing is they do maintain their fat-free mass, and that's in this situation, it's muscles. So it implies that these people are probably exercising. And exercise seems to protect against this fall in energy expenditure. And also, there's evidence that people who have a big metabolic adaptation, meaning they become more energy efficient, they don't lose weight so much. You know, it's this group of 37 people who lost more weight and are exercising more. So, of course, they had a great outcome. That part's good. But I, I wonder if they're representative of the original group. Yeah, that's a, an excellent point in terms of who would stay in the study, the successful individuals. Absolutely. We then turn to the next part of the results, which if you look at figure one, they report out the physical activity. Again, remembering that this is essentially by self-report. We see at baseline, they have high, high, high levels of sedentary 
time and very little activity at or beyond the recommendations. By year one, you can see a flip where there's a significant increase in physical activity, most in line with what would be the recommendations. And that's maintained out to year five, which is quite striking. But again, maybe not surprising if these are the the successful folks. I remember though, some of these people did regain weight. Now we turn to really the the meat of the study, which is what happened to resting energy expenditure. And what they see, and you can look in figure two at the resting energy expenditure, they have it listed out as measured, what actually they measure, and then what they would have predicted would have changed based on on the changes in their um, body composition. So what we see is there there was a 31% reduction in resting energy expenditure at year one. This correlated highly with the changes in body composition, but there was a greater reduction in measured resting energy expenditure compared to the predicted. And that's shown in panel B of figure two. And there the V1, we see that there's a, a negative number. And the bigger the negative, the more the metabolic adaptation. There was greater reduction in measured versus predicted, i.e. it was metabolic adaptation. Dan, any comments on those data? Yeah, and again, I think as time goes by, things get more equal, that metabolic adaptation tends to go away. So I think this supports the idea that metabolic adaptation occurs in surgical patients, but it's more early phenomena while they're losing weight. This later time points, they're sort of regaining people. And again, remember, if people are regaining weight, maybe they're actually in positive energy balance. They're eating more than their energy expenditure. That's why they're gaining weight. And so if, if metabolic adaptation when you overfeed is you become less energy efficient, you burn more calories. So there are several possibilities. One is that metabolic adaptation doesn't happen after surgery long term and that surgery has this unique benefit. Another possibility is that they're just catching people at a time when they're regaining. I don't think we can sort out which of those it is. And again, we don't know what's happening with physical activity, which might be an important component of metabolic adaptation. The authors then present the data based on glucose metabolism or glucose metabolism impairment. And this is shown in table three. So they split out the people into quote normal glucose metabolism, those with pre-diabetes and those with type two diabetes. Now I think the first thing that jumps out at me is look at those number of patients. We're talking there were 10 pre-diabetes, eight in the type two versus 19 in the normal. These are very small numbers, and I think you have to take that definitely into consideration. And what they find is that the patients who had type 2 diabetes lost less weight than those who were, quote, normal versus those who had pre-diabetes. Other parameters are basically essentially as we expected. Now, having said that, those with diabetes still lost 27% of their body weight. It's just those without diabetes lost 32%. So all groups did extremely well with weight loss. Anything jump out at you, Dan? I think no small numbers, so hard to say. But what I'd highlight, though, is that metabolic adaptation, there's a lot of inter-individual variation. So it may be that people who have more resistant obesity, harder for them to lose weight, more likely to regain weight. They have more metabolic adaptation. The pre-diabetes group, they're the ones that had the biggest metabolic adaptation, meaning energy efficiency. So they may be more prone to having difficulty losing weight, more prone to regaining weight because their biology is just more uh, profound than, than other people. So it, I, it just, again, highlights the inter-individual variability, which we, we see in clinic. And it's one of the messages I think we should give our patients is, you know, just it, you don't know what's going to happen. Di- different people respond differently. They then, again, look at the resting energy expenditure and the metabolic adaptation based on glucose metabolism impairment. And we can see that in figures three and four. And basically, they report that there are no metabolic adaptations seen in those with normal glucose tolerance, but there was differences in measured versus predicted resting energy expenditure, i.e. metabolic adaptation, in those with prediabetes and type 2 diabetes. And you can review those data in figure 3, and then the medical adaptation data are presented in figure 4. We have very small sample sizes to be able to see true differences here. Anything that you wanted to point out, Dan? 
No, I, I kind of got ahead myself with my previous comments on that one, I think. Finally, you know, they look at relationships between metabolic adaptation and weight loss and weight regain, and then how physical activity might impact these. And these are presented in figures five and six. And I think one of the things that's a little confusing when you read the text versus look at the images is when they say greater metabolic adaptation, it's a negative number. And so it, it goes the opposite direction than you think. But what we see is in panel A is that the more negative the metabolic adaptation, the less the amount of excess weight loss, but that there was really no correlation between metabolic adaptation at year one or at year five in relationship to weight gain percent. So it did not predict the weight gain, which is what you might think would be the case. The more metabolic adaptation, the more weight gain, but we don't see that. Dan, you want to comment on these? That was also true in uh, The Biggest Loser. There, there was no correlation between the degree of metabolic adaptation and weight regain. Again, we're focusing here on energy expenditure side. What we're not focusing on is energy intake. And regain is a link between the two. And I think the challenge is how does the energy side link to the appetite side? And I think where the field is going is thinking of different people have different phenotypes here. Weight is regulated, but in some people uh, it's tightly regulated and other people less tightly. And so I think the link between this, this side and the appetite side, which isn't explored here, that's probably a key relationship. Right. And I think the final figure, figure six, you know, they look at the metabolic adaptation as it relates to physical activity, both at year one and year two. And data suggests that for those who were, quote, in line with current recommendations and were more active, had a less metabolic adaptation than those who were more sedentary, as you might expect. Again, these numbers are very small. All right. Thanks, Mark. You went through a bunch of data for us there. So what we're going to do now is we segue into the discussion and then eventually the conclusion. We're going to look at how the authors put all of that together and then, then we'll give some of our thoughts along the way. So first of all, to start with what the author's summary is, a couple of, of key points that they make. So they, first of all, at one year after surgery, the resting energy expenditure decreased more than expected only in those with obesity and metabolic impairment. But, and this is their second conclusion, that after five years, along with uh, some mild weight regain, this metabolic adaptation vanished, to use their terminology. So uh, the authors is then, as is pretty typical here, they do a bit of a literature review, and then they do point out that there is conflicting data on that persistence of, uh, of the metabolic adaptation, and, and we reviewed that a little bit already. And so what I want us to, to think about a little bit more are some of these additional findings that the authors point out, not the main ones, but some other ones that they identified. Uh, so one, as we pointed out already, is that the fat-free mastate's stable, even with that weight regain. Mark pointed that out already. And that is also, as Mark pointed out, that the more physical activity that you had, um, that was associated with less of the metabolic adaptation. Now, interesting, we touched on this before, back in the introduction, thinking about some of the potential mechanisms for what's going on here, is the authors point out that in their study, that there are some thyroid hormone changes, that the TSH and that free T3 to reverse T3 ratio decrease with the weight loss. And they point at several other changes that, that go along with that. So, so Dan, does this, do you think, furthers any of our thinking here about whether thyroid hormone is a big driver of what's going on with weight, either initially with obesity or with weight loss after surgery or uh, mild changes and not likely to be important here? It's just consistent with previous studies and, again, highlights how that uh, euthyroid sick is a nutritionally sensitive parameter, something that we see in the hospital. When you see those labs say, what's the nutritional status here? That's just part of this regulatory system. And I think it highlights here, it's hard to know when you, when you see this information, is this just a, a change that's happening? So you're developing this euthyroid sick because you lost the, the weight and, and it's an innocent bystander, so to speak, or is it actually mechanistically involved as actually driving that? So, so I think that that remains to be seen here. Uh, final, another point that the authors make, something we talked about already, is, is that this metabolic adaptation, at least in this investigation, wasn't seen in those individuals with normal glucose tolerance, only in those with prediabetes or with type 2 diabetes. Now, 
far as the limitations go, the authors point out a few on their own. So they, they do point out that there's a bit of a lack of an accurate control of the energy balance state. Uh, they do also point out that their measurement of body composition was done with the body impedance assessment, the BIA, and not a DEXA. So uh, maybe not the gold standard, though, though they point out probably adequate for what they're looking for. They do point out small sample size. We've mentioned that along the way, and the authors certainly point that out as well. Uh, Dan and Mark, any other limitations that we haven't touched on already that you think should be added to this list from the authors? I would say one thing that you know comes up often is are there any sex differences? You know, this group had, you know, there were more women than men. Uh, and certainly we've we see differences in weight loss, weight regain in animal models, but also in human studies as well between uh, men and women. And they did not report any of this out. Now again, small sample size, so maybe there wasn't an ability to see that. And their predictive model didn't include age. Mark mentioned age as a factor. Our energy expenditure goes down inexorably as we age. And since it's five years, you you get almost a 40 calorie difference just of the age in these folks. So that's a modest limitation. Again, before uh, we see older people and they tend to gain weight as we age, and it's partly because of that decline in energy expenditure. Good. So as we wrap things up, I'm, I'm going to end here with what the author's conclusions and also some implications that, that they draw here. So first of all, uh, they, they conclude that this negative metabolic adaptation is relevant only in those with prediabetes or type 2 diabetes and only in the short term. And they point out the differences between these findings and those from lifestyle-induced weight loss suggest different mechanisms. They point out that physical activity, because of the changes or the differences in the groups that Mark pointed out, that it may actually actually prevent that metabolic adaptation after weight loss surgery. And finally, they, they suggest that those with prediabetes or type 2 diabetes may warrant closer post-operative follow-up because of these findings. So we're going to think about some of this and then, then the rest of the data overall. And we'll start here, Dan, we'll start with you. Just give us a thought before we, we'll, we'll get to a second here about whether this should change or, or inform our practice. But just first of all, thoughts about the quality of this study overall, this report. I think the important part is it's a surgical study with long-term follow-up. I think the quality of the data has moderate limitations, yet it it supports the idea that metabolic adaptation is important early, that maybe there's more of that in people who are more prone to hold on to their weight and have difficulty losing weight. And it does raise the question, is there something unique about surgery and, and on the energy expenditure side that makes it so effective? Good. Mark, thoughts on the quality of this report overall? I mean, I think that it's an intriguing study. It gives us some information. These are hard studies to do. You know, we know as clinical researchers, this is a lot of work. And I think we can still learn things from this. So I'll take the positive side. Yeah, yeah, good. So so let's stick with you, Mark, and then and develop that a little bit more. So, so you see a lot of these folks, you do research in this area. Do you think based on this, anything that we can use that changes our practice now? Uh, the authors suggest that more studies are going to be needed here. And, or, so would you take that tax as well and say, you know, we can't really give us some ideas, but nothing we can actually uh, do at this point, nothing actionable for now? Well, I mean, I think it tells us that this metabolic adaptation is a real thing. And even in this uh, population, whether you can generalize it to other bariatric surgery procedures is in question. And that it is a time where we, we have to work with our patients to help them prevent that weight regain. Likely, you know, obviously the physical activity component is probably important, although the, the authors don't show any relationships between the physical activity and weight regain. They only show the relationship to metabolic adaptation. Other studies have shown that physical activity does help. But uh, really, as Dan has mentioned before, they don't talk at all or haven't studied the intake side of things. And that's where we really can help our patients and knowing that they're at risk for weight regain. And so working with them is important. And again, promoting physical activity is a, is a major way to help prevent that weight regain in, in, in those patients. So I think this just supports that, but it also supports the idea that we, we still don't know everything. And as in all research studies conclude, you know, more work is needed. <laughs> yes. All right, Dan, let's, uh, let's end with you as our guest today. Yeah, thoughts on whether this should change our clinical practice? 
Well, I appreciate your listeners thinking about metabolic adaptation with us for 50 minutes. To me, it really highlights what I started with, which is body weight is regulated. And this is another piece of science that emphasizes that. And I think one of the most important things you do with your patients is help them understand the biologic nature of their weight problem and how frustrating it is for them. I think to say something to your patient like, this isn't your fault, you didn't choose to do this, but you have some treatment choices that I'm here to help you with. I think just saying that can be such a helpful thing to these people who sometimes uh, face a lot of bias and stigma. And with that, I would like to thank Mark andre Cornier and Dan Bissesson for joining me for this month's edition of Endocrine Feedback Loop. I know you all learned a great deal and certainly did myself. Please join us again next month. And now you're in the loop. This has been Endocrine Feedback Loop. Endocrine Feedback Loop is brought to you as a members-only benefit of the Endocrine Society with production oversight by Andrea Quilla-Sanchez. <laughs>